hey, everybody, we're back here for another episode of Thriving on Mission. And uh, always good to be back here. And today, of course, got Quinn Harris, our producer. Hey, Quinn. And uh, got a special person here with us today. Um, I don't know if he volunteered or was voluntold to be here today. But anyway, uh, best friend Tim Denton's here with us today to say, hey, Tim. Hey, what's going on? I'll just be your hype man today. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Um, so let's get started today. Um, you know, last week I was just telling Tim about that and uh, really enjoyed having Jenny on the show last week. Tim, you know Jenny as well. I do. And um, it was just awesome to have her on the show and to hear a little bit more about her story and her connection with Eddie and just how that whole thing and, you know, um, I know that they're in the middle of fundraising right now and snowshoeing and all that stuff. So getting ready for a couple of big trips coming up. Yep. Yep. So another shout out. People want to help out that it's tadpolefoundation.org and they can go to that. They can donate. Or if you're a vet with TBI or PTS, highly encourage you to sign up for a trip. Um, that was a, that was a great trip uh, last year. I yeah. enjoyed that. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Um, some parts more than others, but <laughs> <laughs> but we'll, we'll save that for a campfire story, I think, <laughs> if that's all right. So, um, yeah. So just for the listeners, you know, um, yeah, I've known Tim. We've known each other since 1999, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, 99. That's when I came to the unit. Uh, came to the 160th here in Savannah, and you've already you'd already been in the unit for like a year, I think. Yep, I got there June of 98. So, so just about a year before you. Yeah. And then, so basically, you know, up through retirement and then beyond for me, you know, we've been friends and hunt out and done a few things together overseas. You um, retired in 2010 or? 2010. 2010. All right. Yeah. I retired four years ago, 2016. 2016. Yeah. Four years. Can you believe that? <laughs> Yikes. Yeah. It's crazy. Absolutely crazy. I mean, for me, for it to be at 10 years, you know, absolutely crazy. Um, but Tim and I have a lot of, uh, for the listeners, you know, we've got a lot of stuff in common. Um, obviously, you know, we were night stalkers, um, you know, for the majority of our careers, um, and all that entailed combat missions and supporting our nation's, uh, finest, um, day in and night out literally time and time again. So. Yeah, there were years where we spent more time together than we did with our families. <laughs> I remember, I can't remember who I was telling, but I think I, I mentioned that to somebody and I think I even, I was thinking, I was like, you know, I, I've, you know, like with you and, and Mike and, you know, just the other guys is that I slept more with you in a year than I did my wife. And obviously in the context of tents and yeah, don't have any I mean, weird thoughts, but. I think pre nine eleven, there was a couple of years there where we were gone so much. It was just uh, um, all in preparation, of course. But yeah, there there was many a night away from home. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, it, even it added up. Even two thousand two. I mean, it was you know what eight nine months for most of us. Yeah, long time. Yeah, so we got to know each other really well, um, and uh, had lots of fun. Shared lots of memories. Again, some better than others. Hmm. Uh, and, but you know, we survived and we're here today. So we're thankful for that. Um, so there's something I want to, I, I want to talk about today. It's an article I've, I've, I've read for about a few months now. I've had it, read it. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute, but just because of our conversation that we had yesterday at coffee with Tim as well, our conversations always go here and they need to, because we're, we're, you know, you and I are in the over 50 club, but it's specifically, <laughs> you know where I'm going with this? I do. Yeah. Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. The fact that, and Quinn, you don't know this yet, but when people start to reach a certain age, most of their conversations will revolve around their ailments. <laughs> what, uh, what medication you're taking? Yeah. What's bothering you this week? Yeah. Uh, you always wonder, how do you get there? And then I guess when it starts happening, you just kind of. Right. And roll it, with it. And it's funny because I remember when I was a W1, bright eyed, bushy tailed young guy, and we'd look at those old retired or just old W4s, W5s, and crusty W4s. <laughs> and, and, and they're like, oh, my back, or I need to go re get my blood pressure medication or this or that. And that's what they would talk about. And now, 
Look at us. So just for all the listeners, just so they know, I had my best nap ever. And for Quinn, this is going to be new. This probably is new information. My best nap ever was on Monday morning. So I had to fast about 48 hours prior to that. So it was a drug induced, nap. drug induced nap. Yeah. So I uh, had my first colonoscopy. Yay. So that was exciting. And you never uh, forget your first. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Everybody, you know, you told me, everybody else told me, they said, oh yeah. I mean, the hardest part is the prep process, which, yeah, I mean, it was what it was. I thought about food more than anything. That stuff was nasty. That you uh, had to drink the day before. But then everybody else was like, oh, you're going to take the best nap ever. And sure enough, you know, she's like, all right, night, night. And started to press the plunger in on that tube of whatever. The white, uh, white milky substance. And next thing I know, I woke up and done. So, <laughs> so yay me. I get 10 years now till the next one. So Thank Quinn, you. you have that to look forward to. So enjoy when that time comes. But you still probably got Quinn. How old are you? 25? No way. Wow. All right. So only 20 years to go. So one of the things I wanted to talk about today, just for a few minutes, is this article that I've got. Uh, you know, I just dropped it on you, Tim, just a little bit ago. But um, it was a blog post that a guy named Jeff Struker put out. And uh, that name might be familiar to some of the listeners. Uh, Jeff is, uh, he was a ranger in the Army. He served in uh basically you know early to mid 90s he was he was in mogadishu you know black hawk down stuff and you know from then on he did all those other deployments desert shield desert storm and then of course post 9 11 oef mm -hmm. oif um you know he's been there done that you know with the rangers and we we definitely know i think we understand what that means but the neat thing about jeff's story is at some point in there i, th I think it was after it was before Desert Shield, Desert Storm, or maybe it was right after, but somewhere in there, he left the Rangers and he went to seminary. And I'm not, I, I think it was a ROTC program, maybe not, maybe it was, you know, he ended up doing uh, OCS later on, but, you know, she started off as enlisted and then he goes to seminary and be, and comes back in as a chaplain. Hmm. Good with, for him. You know, yeah, I mean, it was just, you know, an awesome story. And the only reason I know about him is, um, he was the chaplain that did the memorial for Turban 3 3 in 2005. And uh, that's crazy. You know, he happened to be the, I guess, the, the task force chaplain at that time. And there was at Bagram. And so, was that the first time you met him? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I don't even think I had a chance to, you know, maybe I even saw him or talked to him for a few minutes. I mean, that time was obviously crazy uh, right. during that time. But, you know, he did the memorial for all the night stalkers that were on board. Because uh, we did one in the task force compound, and then right. NAVSOFT did theirs down in the Siege of compound as well. But you know, I you know I remember asking. I think there was a couple of guys that knew him from Ranger days that were you know we were flying with, and uh, they were telling a little bit about his story. Um, but you know, the biggest thing that stuck out to me from him just from that one moment was you know, not specifically what he said. I mean, you know, I mean, he's a believer, he's a Christian, but the fact that he'd been there and done that, because at that point I was just, you know, I'd only been doing this whole Jesus thing and, and, you know, giving my life to Christ a couple of years before that. Right. And so how do I, how do I, how do I deal with this? How do I deal with this? Now this concept of where, you know, just had, you know, these lives ripped from my life and my friends are suffering, these families are suffering. And again, how do I deal with that as a Christian? But to be able to hear him talk a little bit through that, again, because he was in Mogadishu, you know, he had friends that had been killed uh, during that, back in that time frame too. So. Um, was he actually in Task Force Ranger uh, during Mogadishu? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He was, uh, I don't know what part he was in, or um, I think, you know, he's got his own website, jeffstruker.com and, um, he's got a little bio on his page, but, uh, so now, so, yeah, definitely lends some credibility to, you know, what he's talking about in this article. Right. Right. And he's now, he's got a church in Columbus, Georgia, home of the Fort, infantry yeah, Fort Benning, uh, where Ranger school is at. And, uh, the other interesting thing I noticed is he was also, he won best Ranger like in 96 or something. No kidding. So the guy is not only a Ranger, he's like a stud Ranger, like way up there 
So good for him. Um, yeah. So now he's got just a church there and, you know, still burning the word. So anyway, so he's got a, this blog post titled what the Bible has to say about PTSD. He came out sometime this year, I think right at the beginning of the year, he put that out. And of course I was like, huh, interesting. Knew it. You know, I saw it on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, one of those things that social what media, <laughs> <laughs> one of those, <laughs> one of those things. And it really piqued my interest. Um, Cause again, you know, and he talks about in this article that he gets a lot of questions about this. Cause again, I'm sure that people who go to his church and people, you know, I would imagine he gets lots of soldiers that go there as well and lots of retirees. And if they knew who he is, they're going to ask him, you know, and, um, and I'm sure a lot of pastors get this question that are around military bases, you know, and, uh, but, you know, so the interesting thing is, is so he sort of goes through, um, and I don't know if he necessarily goes through, he, he to me, it looks like this article, it goes through and he talks about sort of the effects of post-traumatic stress. Um, I think he lists one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve mm. items of sort of these effects of post traumatic stress, and then he sort of goes like uh, symptoms or um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it says in his uh, in his opening that this is really nothing more than an attempt to offer some biblical advice to people who may or may not be struggling with. Uh, things they've experienced in combat. I, you know, it may not be all of them. Right, um, right, sure, it, sure. It sure is probably a few of them. Um, yeah. Anybody that's that's served uh, for a little bit of time overseas, either in Iraq or Afghanistan, I'm sure deals with um, some of these symptoms. And, yeah. Uh, for me, it's always nice, uh, you know, somebody that's grounded in the Word uh, and offers some, uh, a biblical perspective of, you know, what the Bible does have to say about, you know, not necessarily just PTSD, because that's what they call it now, but just, you know, what do we do when we start experiencing some of these symptoms? Is there is there scripture we can read that, that can help us uh, understand a little bit more about what we're dealing with, I guess? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and it's just some comforting words that he, that he also offers that, um, because I, you know, I think in one of these, you know, he alludes he suffers from some of these things as well, so he's not just talking the talk I mean, it's things that he walks with and he struggles with and and like you said there's a lot of vets out there from afghanistan and iraq and, and previous you know events and also you know even before we started recording today you, you'd even said you know post-traumatic stress doesn't just affect combat veterans um well, yeah, we we said earlier about you know every every generation has a label for it or has a name whether it's shell shock, um, combat stress, post traumatic yeah. stress. Uh, I think now the term is a lot more encompassing in that um, anybody that has struggled with with some sort of traumatic event, whatever it is in their life, um, um, you can just imagine what they are. But yeah, that, that it's it can. Um, I guess offer some comfort to those as well, not just you know combat veterans. Yeah, yeah, um, you know, and, and both of us, you know, we uh, we've got friends who um, are not of the same faith as us as Christians, and uh, you know, some really good friends, you know, uh, guys that we absolutely love, and and but there's still some really useful things in here, some things right. that that they can apply. Um, you know, I think you know for me and just something that really jumped out is this, I guess the second one on the list, persistent negative beliefs. And, hmm. and, you know, and it's really the belief about, and it's hard sometimes for me to, to, to phrase what this looks like. And, uh, but it's this idea that, you know, either I'm not good enough or um, because of my experiences, because of, the way it's affected me now, I am not as good as what I used to be. And, you know, which leads me down this path of, you know, negative thoughts, darkness, not good places. It can, I mean, it definitely does. And there's times obviously to where it's worse than others. Um, yeah, it can affect a lot of things in your life if, if you're constantly uh, in a negative mindset. And uh, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that one. Um, you know, I had a pastor, it was Dave, as a matter of fact, he had said to me one time, uh, he talked to me one time and, and he said something to the effect of, because I was, I was sort of going on about that, you know, that, that I was sort of lamenting or whining, I guess you could say, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and, uh, you know, and he, he stopped me and he said something to the effect of, you know, yeah, I mean, you are different, you are changed, but that doesn't mean you're any less, you know? I mean, the experiences that you've had now in your life have affected you and there's nothing you can do to change that. Uh, but, you know, the, but there is true, you know, the, 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 there's good that can come from that. Um, That's right. You know, and I like, you know, what Jeff talks about this in these persistent beliefs. You know, he says, you know, all of us have made mistakes in the past. Um, some, you know, have made major mistakes that we keep, wish we could go back and undo. And, um, you know, when we have some negative beliefs about our, 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 ourselves. Um, and then he goes on, you know, and I love this, you know, he uses this Bible verse from Philippians, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any moral excellence, if there's anything praiseworthy, that you dwell on these things, um, you know, which I love that verse. If only that was, uh, you know, you can get a tattoo of that somewhere. Yeah, if only you could get a <laughs> tattoo of that somewhere. And, well, I think the premise of that is that if we sit around and, and constantly focus on on the negative aspects, uh, we just become negative. Everything around us um, is is, um, is negative. Yeah. Whereas if we kind of flip that and we uh, and the Bible even encourages, like it says in here, to deliberately think about positive things or good things. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it talks about focusing on, as it says here in Philippians four, you know, whatever is honorable, just. Uh, just really sticking with a positive frame of mind, even though you've been through some some bad experiences, even though the uh, these things constantly uh, come back to remind you of of your past, it's um, you have to make a conscious effort to uh, stay positive. Yeah, um, exactly. And, and I yeah, I, I like that verse. You know, and he even you know because he says it's uh, you know, and that's what he basically sort of sums up after that. It's that conscious decision, and. Um, and I think maybe a lot of believers or some believers, because I think I fell into this trap at one point that just by reciting a verse, memorizing it, you know, it's not a magic pill. It's not, you know, if I recite what I have tattooed on my arm, that doesn't mean that, you know, like you said, it, these memories are going to go away or that the grief or the sadness are going to go away from them. But it's, uh, you know, especially for this one. And the reason I got this tattoo is because I can look and I can go, oh, it says, whatever is true. And so for me, that's a trigger of go, all right, Matt, think about something that's true right now. Right. You know, what is true? Well, man, I've got this awesome family, you know, um, and I'm so thankful to have Stacy as a wife and Nick as a son or, you know, food on the table, things like that. Um, and really you know, good friends. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, and, but, you know, and again, that's a, that's a, a principle that anybody can apply. And again, not that it's easy all the time. You know, I think, I think I've said that on here enough and you and I have talked about that. You know, there's no magic pill that we can take. No, I think it's just a matter of identifying if you're starting to go down that path of, of negative, uh, either self-deprecating or negative thoughts uh, to try to make an effort to replace them with positive thoughts. I, I think that's all he's trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other one, which I thought was that he that he puts into it, and again, this is this is a great one. There's a couple, but I wanted to hit this one too because I thought about it this morning. It's a startle response, hmm. and the reason I, I bring that up this morning is because you know I can't remember what time it was, but I think it was before woke up, before the sun came up, or the cat jumped on my head. Either one, <laughs> but you know we live out in Pooler, which is a little close to Fort Stewart, and boy, they were shooting off some big artillery today and there's any grant you know just that boom you know the, the the echo of it there's just something in my brain that always triggers back to those there's first you know really it's o2 of when whether it was eod clearing something or somebody found something they shouldn't have found or uh, i mean you remember when was it the F six Canadian F sixteen yeah, pilot? I remember that. You know, dropped all those bombs on uh, Tarnak Farms, and I mean that was still what kilometer and a half away or something like that. But to be woken up in the middle of the day with that huge explosion. Uh, but I really appreciate what he says. Uh, you know, he says uh, you know the startle response. It's it's how the human body reacts to noises of combat, and he and he says. 
This is Jeff's quoting. He says, I still jump on occasion when a gun goes off near me unexpectedly. And it's not, and he says, it's not a bad condition. In fact, it's your body's way. It can be your body's way of saying that you've been through something very traumatic and the results of that trauma don't go away quickly. Hmm. To me, because I hear so much and, and maybe it's just this idea of being in the VA medical system. And I'm going to speak in generalities now at the VA medical system, because there are some great people working at the VA. I've, you know, I've got a great primary care provider. I've met some people that really care and try, but overall as a system, once you get into it, it just always seemed like to me like, all right, we're going to take you through this program and fix you <laughs> and, and push you out the door, you know, versus this sort of this attitude of like, you know, it's going to take time. It's going to, you know, it's not a quick process. It's, and maybe they were saying that to me and I just ignored it. Um, right. You know, but you know, a lot of these things that we experience now and for other combat vets, it, it, it's, it's normal. Um, what was it from our as instructor pilots? We would quiz guys on aeromed stuff and we'd say, Hey, what's stress? You know, we'd have to, you know, what's fatigue? I mean, and I think the definition of stress, if I remember right from whatever the field manual was, was like, it's the body's response to abnormal conditions or I can't, something like that. Yeah. Normal response to an abnormal condition. Yeah. You know, which if we think about this, this whole list of things, you know, uh, he goes on and he talks about aggressive behavior, hypervigilance, self-destructive behavior, self-blame, persistent fear, detachment, all these things that are just normal responses. That's right. I mean, that's all post-traumatic stress is, if you think about it. I mean, they, they don't really have control over these things happening. They have, they have control of how they deal with them or what, what treatment they can get. But you know, right. really all this stuff is is uh, a body's way of reacting to either a combat situation or any other uh, traumatic or abnormal circumstance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and, I, you know, again, for vets, what we see it as is we say, oh, we're, there's something broken with us. There's yeah, something, you think there's something wrong. You know, um, and obviously it's not a choice. And, you know, and there is some chemical reasons, you know, they're start, they still don't understand how the brain works, but there is, and there's also from how we grew up as kids and all these different things that play into who gets it, who doesn't get it, hmm. you know, um, or who chooses not to acknowledge that they have it, right? Um, I know that's a hard one too sometimes for people, you know, but yeah, these are normal responses and, you know, from a faith-based point of view, we were never designed to go through combat. You know, it was supposed to be this Garden of Eden perfect thing. And, uh, you know, so the body and the brain were never designed to be able to experience combat, accidents, sexual trauma, all those things. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, um, difficulty falling asleep. He talks about that. And he specifically, and again, I just love it. You know, he goes, the fact that uh, he goes to the book of Daniel and talks about how Nebuchadnezzar was having these dreams and so much though so that he was having trouble falling asleep. And I'm like, I never knew, you know, <laughs> I never knew that. You know, and the fact that this stuff's been around for a long time. The sleep deprivation. You know, and the, and the fact that, um, that there can be so many things that occupy our minds that, you know, I'm going to lie there in bed and, and I'm like, hey, wait, this didn't happen to other people. Um, you know, and from a concept for, for people that might not be familiar with the story, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar at the time was the most richest, powerful man in the world, he had everything he could possibly wanted, but sleep still eluded him because of these dreams that were tormenting him. And, uh, you know, I was writing, I was doing some writing yesterday morning and just talking about, you know, why is it that, that happens to me and, and, you know, and why are there times you know, I, it's funny before last night, I slept really good for five nights in a row. And it was, I have no idea why I was, you know, my Stacy has asked me, she goes, well, what's something you ate? What did you do differently? And, and how much caffeine did you have? Right. You know, and I couldn't put my finger on it. Uh, but then, you know, um, last night and the night before three in the morning, three thirty in the morning, you wake up and, and the mind immediately goes into this 
some of these other modes that he talks about, you know, right. uh, thinking about fear or catastrophizing. Uh, and, but again, to realize that, okay, that's a normal response. Now, there can be long-term health effects to that too, obviously. Yep. Um, you know, and how you interact with, I mean, that leads to a whole host of other things. You know, sleep is, I mean, if there's one thing, if, if, if there was a, something I could fix, and I say that, you know, jokingly-ish, because there are meds you can take. Mm -hmm. But for me, I think it would be able to get a good night's sleep. Because I think that would roll over into so many other areas of my life. Well, sleep deprivation affects a lot of areas, if not all areas of your life. Yeah. You know, your overall health. Um, you know, most of the, the vets that I've spoken with, guys we've served with, you know, deal with difficulty getting to sleep or staying asleep. Or when they are asleep, they, they you know, either nightmares or, or just thoughts of being back in combat. And, uh, you know, so that, that kind of extends to the next day where they're thinking about or focusing on the, the dreams that they did have and, you know, some good, some not so good, but yeah, that I agree. I, I, if there was an area, I wish I can just, uh, snap my fingers and, and get eight, nine hours of sleep a night. Um, like the kids do, that would be, that would be awesome. <laughs> yep, exactly. Um, and it's funny because sometimes during the day I can take a nap, you know, at a snap of a finger. It's almost like the reverse effect. Yeah, I'm falling asleep when I don't want to, and then I can't get to sleep <laughs> when I need to. And it's like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> you know, and, and some of it I wonder, you know, and again, is it because, and that's what I was writing about, is it because it's also nighttime? Because so many of the things that we experienced in combat happened at night? And, yep. you know, um, you know, not necessarily, you know, aircraft getting shot out from underneath us or anything like that. Or, but, you know, even when bullets weren't flying, much of what we did was at night and it was dangerous. Yep. And, and I think a totally different subject that we could go down on a rabbit trail, you know, and we've probably, I know we have around a bonfire at some point, but that idea that we just, we just didn't know what we didn't know, you know. And in many ways that was good. Yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> of what we were able to do. Um, you know, I remember this is another thought I just had, and I'm just, this is a total random thought, but I, uh, uh -oh. well, I mean, it's on the same, <laughs> it's on the same line, but when we were, went overseas to Afghanistan for the first time and we went up to, to uh, Bagram to see some of the second battalion guys and sort of get a lay of the land and this and that. And I still remember the way some of them looked like, you mean like the the sleep deprived, disheveled look? Yeah, yeah, you know. And we were coming in very fresh eyed and bushy tailed, um, eager to get started. And, you know, you know, waiting for the uh, the kind of like a course rules brief on right how things were going. Right, and, uh, you know. And they've already been doing it. Well, since October. Yeah, I was going to say for quite a few months at that point. You know, and uh, you know, but just thinking back on that moment and what they, you know, but just that look that they had. And again, there was, I mean, we were trained very well at that point, but some of the naivety, eh, not naivety, I guess that's the wrong word, but. No, I know what you're saying. Yeah. I, yeah. You know, we, we didn't know what we didn't know at that point. Right. And uh, what we were soon to find out. Yeah. <laughs> that's coming up too. anniversary. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so many of my, that's the other thing too, is just, uh, and I know you, you know, you and I talk about this quite a bit is my calendar revolves around anniversaries. I was going to say which anniversary. I mean, we got the March 4th anniversary. We got June 28th anniversary. There's constantly anniversaries. And unfortunately, most of them are uh, center around, uh, you know, bad events, death, and memorial services, and, you know, how to kind of pick up the pieces and, and keep fighting. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. The March was, uh, March 4th was a big one. Yep. Yeah. Um. So, but yeah, I, you know, and he goes on to talk about with falling asleep. I mean, meds can obviously help. I mean, you and I are both aware of that. I mean, you know, we got introduced to Ambien, at least I got introduced to Ambien when I was in the unit. Yeah, um, same here. You know, uh, to help us when we were flying overseas to on the bed of a C-17 or the floor of a C-17. Got to reset that clock for a little bit. That's right. Um, <laughs> funny story. And I know you remember this. I, I can't remember. I think we were going to Iraq. 
but we were all rotating through Ramstein and we were in the snack bar and I don't remember who it was, but you know, cause there was like two pilots per aircraft per C-17 that mm -hmm. were in the back with the Chinook, you know, plus the maintenance crews and whatnot. But I don't remember who it was, but one of the, one of us, one of the guys got, gets on the plane, pops his ambient at takeoff. And then like, I guess an hour later, the C-17 had to turn around and go back to <laughs> Ramstein because the windshield cracked. <laughs> yeah, I think that's happened more than once. And I just remember who, whoever it was, they come wandering back into the snack bar with just this like, it was, it was hilarious just because <laughs> they had this ambient drunk to them of like, <laughs> you know, they rolled the dice and lost on that one, I guess. Hmm. They didn't have any ambient from that point. So, uh, but, but on a serious note, you know, there, there is a place for that stuff. Um, you know, and that's something, you know, you should talk, people should talk about with their docs and see what it is. But, um, you know, something, again, I reflected upon yesterday when I was writing was the fact that sometimes I don't take it when I probably should for a number of reasons, even though I know it works really well, but Part of it's the idea that in the middle of the night, what if after I've taken it, I need to do something like yeah, What if the same thing happens to you that happened to the uh, the guy that took it when the C-17 turned around? Now you're you're essentially rendered ineffective. Right. You know, and even yeah. though, I mean, what does that mean to sleeping in my house in my bedroom? I mean, there's some irrational thoughts going on there. I mean, obviously something could happen, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I was letting irrational and fear really drive those decisions of... You know, it's the same reason I, you know, I've mentioned it to you before is, uh, you know, my phone goes to do not disturb from like 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. And there's only a few people that can get through. You made the list, by the way. Yeah. All right. You know, I'm I not going to tell. I'm not going to say who else is on there. <laughs> uh, obviously, wife and son. But, you know, it's because I don't like the phone ringing in the middle of the night. I don't like beepers going off. I don't, you know. Flashbacks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be in the corner <laughs> sucking my thumb. But, you know. Um, but yeah, you know, this is a great article. I would, I would encourage, you know, for, for people, you know, I'll put a link to it with the show notes, wherever this is posted and stuff. But, um, you know, it's a good thing just for, for some people to read through and take a look at and see, you know, I, I think people can find, if anything, healing might be a strong word, but at least be able to go, oh, I'm not the only one. Well, I, I think... Therein lies a, a big benefit to a podcast like this or even an article like this that Jeff put out is, is you know, a lot of people struggle with these things. And uh, sometimes people get the impression if, if they're not, you know, uh, sharing it with others, they, they seem to think that they're on an island by themselves or they're, they're kind of going through this stuff by themselves and they don't want to open up to others about it, whether pride, ego, uh, whatever the case is. But stigma. I, yeah, absolutely. Especially if you're still active duty. Yeah. Um, yeah. The key is that, you know, to realize that you're not the only one dealing with uh, any of these issues. Um, and, you know, the article has an interesting take on what the Bible says about some of these symptoms. But, I mean, you have to realize if, if you're if you're dealing with this, that, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. Uh, it is a normal response. But if it gets to a certain point to go get professional help. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know. And I mean, that, that's why I'm doing this. You know, people say, well, why are you doing a podcast or what's the, you know, goal? And, um, and again, I, you know, no qualms about it. This is therapy for me. Right. I mean, um, plus it's another reason for you and I to hang out and drink coffee today. Amen. Which, which is always a good thing. Uh, awareness is a, <laughs> awareness is so, so key in all this because then people don't feel like, you know, that, uh, or they realize they, they can get help or, you know, that just listening to what other people struggle with can, can actually help them as well. Yeah. And in turn, they can help somebody else. And it's just kind of the uh, pay it forward thing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, just thinking about back with Jenny and the way, she, you know, she was talking about how the organization got started and, you know, when Eddie took his own life and, mm. uh, you know, and so that's why it's called the Eddie Ferlani Tadpole Foundation. And, you know, there's enough organizations named for guys and gals that have taken their life. So if there's anything, you know, that can be done to help prevent that. And maybe this will help somebody. And, but again, helps me. So it's good. Yeah. So, um, Hey, let's just, uh, you know, we'll wrap this up and, uh, you know, there's obviously, you know, and you and I have talked for many hours <laughs> about this type of stuff and, 
you know, and obviously you could go on, but just, you know, I just thought it would be cool for people to sort of get an insight to some of these things, how you and I talk about it and deal about it and faith. And, um, you know, if people want to talk further about it, I mean, they can reach out through the website, uh, thrivingonmission.com and, um, you know, and if they're not in the area, I'm sure we can, you know, I've, I know people different places, you know, people in different places, uh, you know, who are maybe not experts, but at least willing to say, yeah, I'll listen. I'll just provide some insight. Yeah. Or like you said, listen, sometimes that's all it takes. Yeah. So, um, all right. Well, thanks for having me on. Yeah. I appreciate it. Let me hijack the show for a little bit. Hey, appreciate it, Tim. And, uh, yeah, glad, glad for you to be here. And, you know, whether you're sitting there in front of the camera or in the red chair, which apparently is gone now. So, <laughs> All right, folks, so this is another episode of Thriving on Mission, and we will see you next week.